All righty, let's get uh, started. So good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, I guess, everyone. Um, my name is Alessio, I'm the founder and CEO of Forward Fooding, and uh, today we're here to celebrate uh, the world, uh, world's entrepreneurial food tech talent, um, and in particular, as uh, we did uh, announce our Food Tech 500 2020 uh, on the 15th of February. Um, today, we're going to actually talk about uh, women and uh, women who work in actually food tech. And before I do that, let me uh, start introducing our uh, Master of Ceremony, Sue Nelson. Um, Sue, if you want to take it from here. Yeah, hi, Alessio. How are you doing? I believe you're in Barcelona. I'm uh, am, in England at the moment and it's raining. Uh, this is very exciting, um, and, and we've got uh, we've got a great lineup of, of women who've been in the food sector for quite some time. So, I'm hoping anybody listening is going to learn quite a lot today. I'm <clears throat> I'm looking forward to it myself. Um, so, our agenda just very quickly: uh, ten minutes. You're not allowed to do more than that, <clears throat> Alessio. Just ten minutes introducing the 2020 Food Tech 500. Um, which is really taking off. Um, uh, that's very good. Um, then we've got the lovely Ingrid Williams, uh, founder and CEO of Data Scouts, who's going to be talking uh, for 10 minutes on that. And then I've got this amazing panel. I'm, I'm feeling a, a little bit like I've really got to up my game on this um, uh, from some, some great um, food companies. We've got some really good questions to ask them. In particular, how's everything panning out at the moment? How's everybody coping? What do we see the trends at as and and you know is there anything significant or special about being a, a woman in in the food business? Um, so we'll have a really good discussion uh, with these guys. We'll introduce them later, and then uh, if you're listening in, you've got ten minutes. Um, please ask lots and lots of questions, and we can take those and offer them to our panel. I'm going to hand you back to Alessio. Thank you very much, Sue. So without further ado, let me just uh, uh, keep uh, uh, going with the agenda. As uh, Sue mentioned, uh, I have 10 minutes to actually introduce you to uh, Forward Fooding and uh, the Food Tech 500. Uh, well, it's, Forward Fooding is the world's first collaborative platform for the food and beverage industry. We started the company back in 2015 in the UK, and uh, we basically have a very simple mission, which is uh, to empower our clients with data insights and connections from our global food tech network to foster collaborations uh, in to create a brighter future of food. What this means is effectively we connect the ecosystem stakeholders to actually foster innovation and to help redesign eventually our food system. Um, how do we do this? Very simply with data and insights. So we've developed a platform called the Food Data Navigator, which allows us to monitor uh, all the players of the global agri-food tech ecosystem and, and pen out all the connections among them. Um, on the other hand, we do scouting and matchmaking. So we help large corporates and investors to understand the landscape and identify companies, accelerators, and other ecosystem uh, stakeholders that they can engage with. Uh, and last but not least, with our startup network, uh, we provide basically visibility to uh, startup and sales companies through the Food Tech 500, which I'll tell you more in a, in a second, and through our Food, the food Tech Innovation Hubs, uh, which now are in London and in Barcelona, uh, we basically help uh, resident companies to grow faster. And uh, uh, very quickly with our database, uh, we launched this uh, uh, data intelligence platform back in 2019 with about actually 2000 uh, ecosystem actors. And uh, we've now grown it to about 10,000 uh, players, including accelerators, incubators, uh, inter international uh, startups and scale-ups companies, accelerators, uh, sorry, uh, institutional investors and uh, corporate and corporate venture capital. And uh, this is basically how is the tool that we actually use to uh, make sense of the ecosystem and understand and, and be on top of the, the latest uh, developments that are coming out of it. Um, our network, just at glance, uh, we basically have works with about uh, uh, 20 corporate clients and completed about 35 strategic uh, consulting uh, projects. We currently work with f five Fortune uh, 500 companies. We've mapped about 5,400 uh, uh, companies in our uh, Food Data Navigator. We have 15 uh, resident companies between uh, the London and Barcelona innovation hubs. And uh, through only the Food Tech 500, we've received about 3,300 applications in the last two years. 
Um, and uh, we basically have a network of about 60,000, 16,000 uh, subscribers to our uh, mailing list and, um, and all our, on all our uh, institutional channels. These are some of our partners, supporters, and clients. Uh, we blend them in into, into one bucket as we believe that uh, we basically work with them in different ways, but we, they're all our partners at the end of the day. Uh, but now, without further ado, um, I want to introduce you to the Foodtech 500. As I mentioned, we launched uh, the rank list on February the 15th, um, so only a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is a massive project that uh, keeps me awake at night, but I'm so proud of uh, what we have achieved this year. Uh, and really, the, the point uh, and the reason why we do it is, uh, is, to spot, uh, is to shine a spotlight on the innovators that are really, we think, fixing our food system through technology and entrepreneurship. Um, the scoring mechanism that we use is, is fairly simple. Uh, we use the business size and digital footprint score that we are actually taken from uh, our food data navigator. Ingrid uh, later will tell you also a little bit more about that as uh, um, we have been working with them to, uh, to, to, do, to develop the, the platform, or better yet, we take the platform from them. Um, and uh, the sustainability score was actually developed around the SDGs and was devised uh, in collaboration with the University of Turin um, with sustainability experts that have created a survey that we then um, asked the companies to fill out, uh, which then, based on their responses, we created the sustainability score. <clears throat> but again, we couldn't have done this uh, ourselves uh, alone, so we've actually partnered up with uh, a number of different uh, uh, ecosystem stakeholders, including... Uh, uh, our media partners, so organizations like ours in different parts of the world that uh, actually map their ecosystems and have helped us to spread the word uh, about the code for application and, and make sure that we could get to as many countries as possible. Our technical partners, Data Scouts and University of Turin, and also our sponsor, which I would like to thank you also for uh, allowing us to run uh, this type of webinars, which are Neom and Rottenstead Enterprises. Uh, some just some key numbers really quickly. Uh, with this year, we received uh, over 2,000 applications, which was uh, uh, an overwhelming amount, and it wasn't easy for us to actually go through them. But we have very uh, patiently done that uh, so that we could uh, create uh, the short list of 500. We've covered about 63 countries in terms of applications and about 52 uh, in terms of the companies who actually made into uh, the final ranking. Um, and so far, we had about uh, 370,000 page views with 60,000 visitors from uh, over 170 countries, which again makes, it, makes us really proud about the exposure that we can actually offer to the companies uh, that have made it into uh, this year list. And we already have about 400 companies that have pre-applied for 2021. Um, these are just some of the stats, and uh, I'm going to close it up uh, really here, um, where of, of the cluster of companies. So we don't only want to, sh uh, to shine a spotlight on the innovators and, um, and the solutions that they have developed, but we also want to showcase that these companies are actually growing really fast. And uh, um, 400, you know, and 23 of them have received uh, investments already, 374 are already revenue generating. And as a cluster, they've raised more than 4.1 billion uh, euros in funding over time which again, I think this number speaks by themselves about uh, the, the type of, uh, of companies that actually have made it into, into our listing. But most and foremost, the, the, very, the very key uh, data point that I want to showcase here is that 25%, uh, uh, more than 25% of actually uh, the companies that uh, make our list this year are actually female founded or have females in their leadership team. Uh, this year, we really went above and beyond to understand better what were the driving factors of, uh, of this ecosystem. And we think that actually diversity and uh, the fact that an incl inclusiveness is really what uh, sets this ecosystem apart from many other techs, which, uh, as you probably know, um, the, the average stats in terms of the composition of their founding team are way lower than, uh, than, our, than our listing. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, this, uh, this is, uh, uh, I, I don't want to stay to take more, more time. Uh, today we're also releasing uh, the top 10 women food, in food tech report, uh, along with uh, another uh, nine that we actually have released uh, two weeks ago. 
and uh, which will be available as of now on the forwardfooting.com as last reports. And uh, we have another uh, six, actually, uh, eight actually, uh, reports that we will be launching soon uh, during our next sessions. Um, in particular, uh, we will be launching uh, uh, the alternative protein uh, one on the 17th of um, uh, April. Uh, which then will be followed by uh, the one about vertical farming, which will, will be released on the 31st. Um, and other that you see on the slides, which uh, will, be, will be made available uh, over the next couple of weeks. But without further ado, let me pass it over to Ingrid, so that uh, she will tell you a lot more about Data Scouts. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, Ali, for the, the introduction, you have been going very, very quick, so I'll, I'll try to slow down the pace a little bit so that everybody can settle down and, and, and understand where, where we are. So I'm really very pleased to be here um, you know, and share with you a little bit who we are as data scouts and how we are enabling um, the food, forward fooding and the Food Tech 500 to um, really um, move things ahead. I'm just not able to um, move to the next slide. So Ali, if you could perhaps go to the next slide. Yes, perfect, thank you. Um, so what's our mission as data scouts? Mainly, it all started from the idea that today, if you want to survive, you don't do that on your own. Ecosystems and platforms are the way ahead. They enable much more collaboration and they fuel a lot of new business models. So. Um, I was really looking for a way of how can we really tap and build collective intelligence so that more and more innovative companies can really break through and can be successful. Um, and that was where it all started. Of course, a bit combined with the idea that, you know, um, there's a lot of repetitive tasks in, in building intelligence, market intelligence, whatever. Um, so how can we leverage new technologies as AI and machine learning to automate those? Just to give you an idea, if you really want to understand what is happening in your market, um, you need to understand the stakeholders. You need to map and to profile them. As Ali said, it was going from, in the end, 2,000 two years ago to 10,000 today. You don't want to do that all manually. Um, if you want to scout for new technologies and new innovations, you can do it manually. You come across a lot, but you need the tools in order to really get that information at your fingertips and really assess if they're right or not. Even further, as Ali has been saying as well, um, you know, it's not just the startup, it's the whole ecosystem around the startups that might make them successful or not. So that's as well a point that we found, like, how can we use machine learning to gather information about who's connecting with who, who is spin-offs, who is investing in which types of, of companies? And finally, how can we monitor how an ecosystem is evolving? What are the dynamics? What is really the driving forces and the capabilities for growth in an ecosystem? So that is mainly where it all started. And if we go one slide further, <laughs> um, you will see that these are the tools that we have been building over the last five years. I started together with Jan, my co-founder five years ago, and we mainly started from how can we use data from multiple data sources to bring them together to build marketing competitive intelligence. That's where it all started. Like this is still our flagship product, I would say. How can we really make sure that somebody can continuously gather information about what is happening in their specific market. What are the new uh, innovations? What are my competitors doing? What are new marketing competitive and technology trends? So we can take fast decision whenever we need it. Now, then we came very quickly to see that there's quite a lot of incubators, accelerators, creative hubs, that are really working already as an ecosystem. And they really want to tap into that collective intelligence of the crowd. As Ali was saying for forward footing, how do you get people to um, you know, participate their knowledge and, and share their insight in order to build a real complete overview of a market? So we started adding crowdsourcing capabilities, stakeholder engagement capabilities to that market and competitive platform. So you don't use it only within your company, but outside your own company really, and the boundaries are your ecosystem, which is quite wide. At the same time, um, we got more and more people that were really asking like, you know, just monitoring what I know already. Well, that's not fun. I really wanna know what I don't know yet. And that's of course, very much more difficult, um, or at least it, it requires a completely different approach. And that's where we started based upon all the information that we got and then the experience we got and to start building a technology and innovation scouting platform. Um, in all of this, 
uh, even in, in the scouting of technologies, it's not just like having a database of companies. It's really trying to find solutions for a question that is still very vague, a research question that might need a, a multidisciplinary solution. So how can we bring together a sort of interesting list of relevant stakeholders that could add um, and contribute value to the solution that you have in place? Um, in everything we do, we always bring together the human knowledge with the artificial intelligence to, to create that collective intelligence. So if we go one slide further, we see the different um, companies that we're serving today, uh, or the type of companies at least. Um, there's some very large ones. There are retailers like Colgut who are really using our tool to, to monitor what is happening uh, in that market. The retail market, the food market, it is changing. They talk a lot about fusionomics, how different sectors are are, are are really converging in a way and what that would mean for them. They're very much used of tracking everything that has to do with their inventories to, to know what a consumer behavior is, but they were less experienced in really mapping and watching their ecosystem or the ecosystems of innovation of new products and services around them. That's exactly what we do for Colgate Hope. For PNG on the other side, um, I think everybody knows on their side, they are very ambitious towards 2030 to enable and to implement their sustainability goals. So for them, we're mainly doing innovation scouting. Um, well, you might ask yourself, how do they come to a small company and a startup mainly scale up in Belgium? Well, the companies they use with are all based in Silicon Valley and they only seem to find solutions that are US based. While we have such a rich database or you know, the database is such a rich ecosystem on innovation here in Europe, but the text that we're writing, our websites are not always in English. So it's not so easily found by their tools or their capabilities. And that's exactly what we have been looking into and specializing in. How can we make sure that these kind of companies get hold of what is really use, you know, happening mainly in Europe, in Asia, and in Africa? So we're mainly focusing our capabilities there. Um, and the last one, it's it's Smart with Food. It's a startup in based in Belgium. It's one in the food sector that has really ambitions as well to grow. Um, on one side, their database. On the other side, of course, their customer base. Um, and for them, we did a market trend analysis to understand who their competitors are and what are the ways forward in order to expand. So just to tell you, some very large organizations, some very small organizations, and like um, forward fooding as well, cluster organizations that want exactly to do the matchmaking between both. And really what drives us, we want to help these companies to stay front runners in their business, to really make sure they're the best informed companies in a world that is changing very quickly and is really less predictable as it was ever before. So if you want to know more about Data Scouts, please look at the datascouts.eu website or please reach out to me later on. I think here at I can hand over back to Sue. So spot on, dead on 20 past. Well done, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm going to now uh, uh, trot over to our uh, amazing panelists. I'm going to introduce them. There are four of them, all impressive in their own way. So I'm first gonna introduce Rachel Hugh. Now she is co-founder of the Verga company. Um, after a trip to California in 2016, which seems like a distant dream now because none of us are allowed to fly off anywhere. But anyway, in 2016, she was wandering around the Golden State and she saw what an impact uh, vegan street food was having. Um, and she made it her mission to bring convenient, accessible and delicious vegan food um, over to the UK. Um, she started off uh, with Neil creating a... Um, food stall in Spitalfields Market, if anybody's been there. And um, the I remember having uh, Rachel on my podcast, the Food Talk podcast, a few years ago. Uh, she said she'd bring me a burger to taste, but she never did, everybody. Well, and to be honest, I still haven't forgiven her. Uh, but since then, uh, over four years ago now, the brand has exploded in popularity, multi-site restaurants. She's got a retail company. You can get burger meal kits and sauces. And she's raised over two million to date and Rachel was named on the Forward Fooding Top 10 Women in Food Tech. And also Virga has most recently included as number 18 in this year's Food Tech 100 
final ranking. Got loads to ask you, Rachel. Uh, next, we have uh, Maxine Roper, uh, co-founder of Connecting Food. She's worked in marketing and uh, sales for Nestle and Mars. Uh, probably got a lot of chocolate at your house, I would imagine, uh, before moving from England to France in the 1990s. She's, uh, she's uh, joining us from Paris now, I think, um, aren't you, Maxine? Yes, she uh, was also brand director uh, on coffee at Sara Lee and marketing director for Bon Maman Group. I buy their blackcurrant jam, thought you'd like to know that. Um, but after all that mainstream big business experience, she decided to leave the comparative warmth and safety of being an employee to branch out on her own with Stefano. Why? You ask yourself, why would she do that? Well, because she's passionate about the agri-food industry and utterly convinced that something was missing because almost none of us know where our food really comes from. So putting food into your body is a remarkable act of trust in the person who's produced it. And uh, of course, it's open to abuse. So Connecting Food came up with the first solution to use blockchain to trust and most importantly, certify uh, food products in real time to provide more transparency. The big question I will be asking Maxine today, of course, as seeing as you're in France, have you had your COVID vaccination yet? <laughs> That's just a little English joke there, Maxine. Um, Emily uh, is a co-founder and a CEO of Oddbox. So that's Emily Van Popperite, which I think I've pronounced correctly. Again, another extremely impressive corporate player with project and team management experience in Fortune 500 companies uh, such as 3M and BT across the globe. She's originally from Northern France, but she's done a swap with Maxine and now she's uh, been in the UK for the past 10 years. Um, and a little known fact is that her grandparents were potato farmers. Um, so she knows what it takes to grow fresh produce and presumably she's a bit of an expert on crisps and vodka too. Um, her and Deepak trotted off to Portugal one year for the sunshine and went to the local market. She couldn't believe the wonky veg and fruit on sale and of course realised that if our supermarkets insist on only good looking veg and fruit, the rest, about 30% of it, is going to waste at the farm and not even getting to potential customers. Um, so that doesn't even include the, um, the food waste that, 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 we, that we have at home. Um, they started negotiating with producers and farmers to take the stuff that never sees the light of day and deliver it, delivering it in veg boxes to grateful customers who understand these things. Um, they started off in a small room doing this on a Saturday and now deliver some 35,000 boxes across uh, London and the southeast of England every week. And I presume, Emily, you're not still doing that from your bedroom. At least I hope not. And then finally, uh, Lynette Kuzma uh, from Natural Machines, co-founder and CMO. Lynette um, started the company some seven years ago with Emilio. She's worked in New Jersey and New York, um, was, was educated in America and was the senior PR for EMEA at Microsoft based out of the UK. But now she lives in lovely Barcelona, of which I'm very jealous. The company has won some 40 odd awards, uh, top emerging health and wellness start, startup, as well as the food tech startup to watch. Natural Machines has released their first product, which they call Foodini, a 3D food printer. It allows you to make on-demand personalized sweet or savory food using fresh ingredients. Uh, you could have one of these at home. Um, I'm definitely a uh, fancy one. Uh, it's not just for professional chefs. You could make an elaborate chocolate sculpture, a beautiful raviolo, which I think is the singular ravioli, crackers for cheese, you name it, it's endless. And, and basically you choose a recipe, uh, Foodini instructs you, what food to put in each capsule. You've got a touch screen, it's connected to the internet, and then the printing begins like magic. It's marvelous. So, bloody, can't really beat uh, that, that panel. And I've got some questions, uh, uh, loads of questions here, and then I'm going to interview each one individually later on. Um, so Rachel, just to start with you, um, why did you specifically go into the food sector? I mean, it's a hard, it's hard work and it's a pretty crowded arena. So, so, so Rachel, what att attracted you in the first instance? Is Rachel there? 
I'm going to ask Emily that question instead. Emily, why did you specifically go into the food sector? I know, I know that, that wonky veg was your, your, your passion, um, but it is hard work and it's pretty crowded. So what drew you to that in the first, first instance? Yeah, so, so obviously my background is not at all in, uh, in food or fresh produce. So even though my grandparents were potato farmers, I actually never worked on the field. I heard a lot of stories from my dad. Um, but actually for me, it came more from uh, food is something that we consume on a ba daily basis. There was some frustration coming to the UK of seeing everything available all the time, but everything in plastic and everything looking perfect and just you know, strawberries in winter don't taste of anything. And, um, and then I kind of looked into what was happening in the supply chain, did a bit of research, and that's when I came across the issue of food waste and realized, as you mentioned, that a third of the food we produce each year is thrown away and never consumed. And, uh, and I actually worked in the charity sector before that. And for me, there was that angle of sustainability and doing something good for, for the planet, which uh, really resonated with me. So the, it was a combination of food and doing something good for the planet, which kind of uh, made me take that step into uh, tackling the issue of food waste and kind of realizing that actually there's so much resources which go into growing produce that we never consume that it felt like we had to do something about it yeah and, and rachel sorry you cut out earlier why 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 would you join the food sector again most of you had have had very different careers in all sorts of places but what, what attracted you to the food sector well, um, my history, well, thank you so much for the introduction, by the way. So nice of you. Um, the, the, whole, the whole reason um, we actually began and we began on this journey, like you alluded to in, in the introduction. So Neil, my co-founder, actually suffered really badly with um, stomach issues and he did for a really, really long time. Um, and we made that connection. And it sounds so simple now, but back then it wasn't such a, a big thing to us. And we made this connection between what we were eating and the direct impact that that was having having on, on our health and sounds simple as I mentioned but when we delve deeper into that a little bit more and started understanding food production the origins of ingredients the transparency of ingredients on restaurant menus or lack thereof and um, this all started to matter to me so so much and I think it was at the time realizing how much of a negative impact it was having on Neil's health made us want to really make a change. Um, so I think in doing our research and discovering how important a vegan lifestyle for us was um, for not only for his health, but also the future of the environment and sustainability of the planet. So I think um, we really wanted to, to help other people connect those dots also. And that's kind of why we got into it in the very beginning. And, and actually, that's a really uh, interesting question for you, Maxine. That's a pretty good segue, I think. Um, you know, we've got we've got sustainability reasons, we've got health uh, reasons. What um, brought you in, uh, Maxine? Don't forget your things on for the moment. <laughs> Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, right. So, yeah. And, uh, and yes. Uh, your your uh, your business is obviously connecting food. Is it? Yeah. Like yeah. Well, I, I actually came from the food industry. I spent uh, over twenty years working in big food corporations, putting food on the market, marketing food, and then also working in the upstream parts. That was really interesting, moving to the producers um, that are actually supplying all the meat, the vegetables, the grain, everything to the, the, the branded manufacturers for which I was working for like 15 years before. And that's really where you, you see a huge opportunity in terms of transparency, because there are some amazing things happening in the upstream parts, um, how you're producing food, who's producing that food, um, all the great things that are actually happening. Um, and then that's actually not really being, um, there's a shield with the brands, not because there's any voluntary uh, need to actually shield anything, but because when you're working in a branded manufacturer, as a branding ma manufacturer, you're more to turned towards what the consumer wants, rather than what really is happening in the upstream part. And so um, I really saw this opportunity to be able to show and prove what really is happening, rather than having to, um, you know, uh, go into the more of the um, the, the practical side of uh, snacking and food and everything of the 90s and the in the 2000s when in fact what was happening in the farms and what's happening in terms of how you're producing 
or that food is a lot more interesting. And the, I think times have changed. Um, today, we're more looking at um, the authentic story behind a brand, the authentic story of where our food comes from, who produced it, because you know there's a lot of people behind that. There's a lot of um, regionality behind that. And what we wanted to do is really to be able to give, use tech to be able to help uh, producers, but also brands and all different food actors to prove that point and to actually show it directly to the consumer. Okay. So it's really transparency and proof in food. So again, we've got environment, health and well-being, uh, um, and, and authenticity. Um, and Lynette, with, with your background, again, you're, you're very much like Maxine. You've come from big business, so to speak. And what attracted you to, to working 24 hours a day and, and being in the food sector, working for yourself? Yeah, it literally is 24 hours at times. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I come from New Jersey, as you said in my introduction, and that's known as the garden state in the US. So perhaps it was a bit into my genes because my dad always had a hobby of having a huge garden. That's what he did in his free time. But really, you know, it was kind of just interest. I think there's a lot of commonalities in the panel that we all focus on sustainability, giving knowledge to people, <laughs> trusting our food and knowing what's in it. It's the same with me. So I kind of fell into food tech uh, because I have personal interests in health and that includes what we eat. And I had some personal issues in my family where we're, when my daughter was young, she had a, a you know a skin condition and fast forward, it kind of was you know a, a food issue. It's not a food allergy, but it was a food issue. So that kind of got me into reading the China study and all these books about food and what it really does to our bodies. And that's kind of how I started really getting into a passion to the food aspect of things. And I came from a tech background. So to combine the tech and the food together was really a perfect match for me. So it was good timing and um, just meeting my co-founder and the state of food and food tech even coming up as an industry, which didn't exist 10 years ago uh, as it does today. It was really good timing and my passions coming together at the right time. I mean, you can you can tell, uh, you know, everyone is joining us uh, at the moment that, 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 that passion is one of the things that's coming through. Um, and and I'd, li I'd like to start with you, act actually, Rachel. Now you're sort of four or five years on and, and you made the ridiculous decision after you got back from California <laughs> to start the company, um, uh, you, you know, with, with vegan feed. Is there one piece of advice, practical advice that you would give anyone who actually wants to get into this sector at the moment, but particularly female? Um, I, do you know what? There is so much that I've learned in the last five years. I, I, it, it's impossible to kind of, to, to, to pick one. but I think, um, you know what? I, I would have focused on technology sooner rather than later. Obviously the pandemic really forced us as an industry to really hone in on it. Um, I think the whole of the hospitality industry here in the UK and probably worldwide would have said the same thing, but I think just personal to me, um, definitely stay true to your voice and your brand voice. I think there will be lots of strong opinions from all sorts of people along the way. Um, and I think uh, some of them are useful, some of them maybe not so much, but I think you can get bogged down by so many of those opinions along the way. And um, I think staying true to your vision and your mission along the way has definitely helped us and guide, guided us um, along the way as well. Um, Lynette, you're seven years in. Um, uh, one piece of practical advice, uh, Anybody considering coming into the sector? Well, considering coming in, I think there's a lot more opportunities these days to see what even that sector is about, whether it's from the Food Tech 500 list and getting knowledge or, you know, the shows which are now virtual, but ideally in person when we get back to that. So I think there's just a lot more opportunity now to find out what those things are. But getting um, to tag on what was just said, you had, there are a lot of strong opinions and more so in food tech than any other industry I've worked in. I've come from fashion, from advertising, from Microsoft and mobile phones. Food tech is the one that will have the most diverse commentary. So you almost have to have a pretty thick skin because food is passion, right? So there's so many different diets, so many different foods, so many different opinions on what is right. And there's no one right answer, right? So everybody's different. Everybody has their own opinions. But, you know, what we do is controversial because we're mixing technology and food. And that means a lot of food tech companies are controversial. So you're going to get people that hate what you do to love what you do to everything in between. And you just have to have a bit of a thick skin, really, you know, as you say, stay true to your mission, know what you're doing, listen to those people that are the haters. 
Um, if anything, they've helped me fine tune my marketing messages <laughs> so I can become much more clear on what we actually do. There's people who tend to read the headlines only and not the content, meaning that they just see, oh, you do 3D food printing, you're awful for the sustainability, why are you doing that? But once they understand why we do that and how we do it, they're like, oh, you really are sustainable and you're more practical than a lot of other solutions. So it's really, you have to have a thick skin to be in this industry. It's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I started a business from scratch and then sold it after five years um, to, to Ernst & Young, EY, one a you know, huge multi-billion pound organization. And as, as we got bigger, I, I, you know, I want everybody to like me, but actually when you're in business, that's not possible. <laughs> and I think as we got more successful, I realized that, that, that people are going to give you more of a hard time because actually they're either slightly jealous of what you're doing or, or they, you know, they don't think they're doing it in the way that they would do it. And in some ways, it's a sign of success. And you've got to learn. And, and personally, I don't think women are quite as good as this as men. I think you've, you've got to learn to have that, that, that thick skin because you will have to drive um, um, through it. Um, Emily, you've grown really quickly as well, um, uh, uh, you know, since, since you started. Would you echo some of this advice? Have you got a different bit of advice for anybody that's listening who wants to get into the sector? Yeah, no, I, I would echo uh, that advice. And I think especially, uh, so you know, it's... Uh, it's important to stick to kind of your vision and mission. I think it's important to stick to your business model and actually uh, have a really kind of very clear focus and be able to say no to quite a lot. So for us, our model is that we're supply supply led. So we take the produce. So nobody grows for us. We take produce that are surplus and. Uh, uh, again and again, we were asked by cafes, restaurants, whether we could supply them. They have a completely different model where they have menus, and therefore we, we would need to cater to specific requirements. And so we had to, uh, even though it was an attractive market, we had to say no to quite a few of these opportunities. But uh, it it meant that we're, people are very clear on what we are about. So it's about clarity of the message and clarity for the customer. It's better to be about one thing uh, and because that makes it very clear in terms of the, uh, the brand recognition. And another thing that I would say for people who can are thinking about starting is that I didn't have any experience in, uh, in fresh produce nor food. And actually, uh, People might think it's a barrier. Sometimes it's uh, useful to not have sector knowledge because that's how you can disrupt uh, what's happening in the sector. Hmm. And, and uh, Maxine, again, you, you've you've grown quite quickly. I mean, exactly what Emily's saying is it's not just about brand. It's about being clear. It's what you stand for, you know, really sticking to that. As you grow and you get more people, how do you get your staff and the people that you work with and your suppliers to share that vision and make sure they understand it? I think, I think uh, being very focused is really important. Knowing what you're not, as well as knowing what you are as a company, and really sticking to that, because um, I agree with what's been said. There is, there's so much advice and there's a lot of temptation to actually do something slightly different. And you, and you can't do that. You just need to stick to what you are and what your mission is and what your strengths are. I think there's also another point, which is very early on, an advice that I'd give is, talk about your idea right from the start. There's a lot of people that say you shouldn't talk about your idea because somebody else might steal it. But what you actually hear, and I, I really agree with this comment, is that if your idea is a good idea, somebody else has already had it. And if it's a bad idea, nobody wants to steal it. But when you talk about your idea a lot, you get so much feedback and you need to be able to um, you know, uh, sort through what is good feedback and what is bad feedback but it helps you to really clarify what you are and really clarify what you're not. And just to come back to your question, which is obviously when you have um, staff and you're recruiting, you need to be really clear about what you are and, and what you are not because you have other people selling your product and you have other people deploying your product um, and rolling it out. So that's even more important. Well, they're representing you. So it's really, really important, isn't it? You know, actually, exactly. Because you know, what you can't be is you can't be the whole company as you get bigger. So, so people have got to buy in to that vision and you've got to make it, I think Emily was saying, you know, you've got to make it really clear so everybody buys into it and, and, and goes forward with it because, because they're representing you and your, and your passion. Um, I'm going to be a bit controversial here because I do like being a little bit controversial and um, so I don't care what anybody says. Um, I think women, and, and I know this is a generalisation, 
uh, tend to have a, a natural inclination to better understand food and why it's important. Um, and for me, it was having my first child. Um, I suddenly realized, it just dawned on me, I was totally in control of, of what she ate. And, and I wanted to get that right. And do you know what? It's not as easy as you think. It's, it's actually quite confusing and even more so now. Um, and of course, dads are thinking about that too. But how can we get more women into food and food tech? Because I do think they have a, a particularly interesting and important role to play. Um, Lynette, have you got any views on that? You can disagree with me on quite a few on that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I won't disagree with you too much there, <laughs> having two kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know... It's a nurturing thing. I think <laughs> that's just what I'm trying to say, I guess. And I, I know it's, it's a generalisation, but... <laughs> Again, to get more women into food tech, you know, it's an ed educational process, of course, you know, we didn't have the internet 10, 20 years ago, so it's not the same as it is today, whereas today you have access to a lot of different resources and a lot of different stories. I mean, I think you have to make it fun and exciting. You know, one of the things we do is we have a visual product. So kids are naturally drawn to what we do. So it's a curiosity stream, and then they can start following that stream down and seeing where it leads to. Um, it would be nice if food tech was kind of more mainstream, just in terms of, I don't know, like we've been in a couple movies as props, you know, so it's always fun to do that. So people kind of are like, oh, that could be the future or what is that, you know, make that controversial statements, but just to make it a bit more fun for kids to get engaged. So whether it's mentoring or doing something more with the schools, getting schools engaged, we've had 3D foodpreneurs in schools just for the day so the kids can have some fun with it and and so those types of opportunities we really like to pick up on because even though it's nothing that's you know directly related to financials necessarily for what we do, you know we do appreciate that kids get engaged, they get excited, they get excited about this type of tech and what they're seeing, and they're very creative with things that they do with it. So whether it's super young kids or even high school, university, I think it's really important to do those things. So I do a number of these types of webinars now over the past year with COVID to universities and people looking at career options. But I think it just needs to be something that's made exciting and, and very visible so that people know it's at least an option to get into. Now, I was always kind of jealous of when CSI came on TV, it has nothing to do with food tech, but I was like, you know, I never thought of becoming a CSI agent until it was on TV. You know, so to make something really cool and be in TV or movies would be super helpful to kind of invigorate the next generation of searching into a food tech opportunity. Well, role models, yeah. Um, Emily, again, do, do you sort of agree that, that women could bring, I, I know it's a ridiculous generalization and, and we're not probably allowed to say these sorts of things now because of, you know, gender roles, gender stereotyping and stuff, but, but do you feel that women have a, a specific thing that they could contribute and that we should get more, more women into the sector? Yeah, so in terms of our customers, uh, 75 to 80 percent of our customers are women. So actually, the women are still kind of the, uh, the kind of the driver in terms of making food purchasing decisions. So uh, in some ways, um, they should be represented to that percentage in uh, in the food sector. So we're we're seeing uh, so in terms of our gender diversity, we're probably kind of uh, 50 50, probably more women uh, actually at Oddbox than men. I, th I think that's what you're mentioning, seeing role models and seeing other women succeed. Again, uh, it's, I think at junior level, it's less of a challenge than it is at senior level, but that's across sector. I think a challenge is still that uh, a lot of investment is uh, made by, uh, by men, and therefore that doesn't necessarily kind of encourage women to start uh, in uh, a business in general. I mean, there's some research to say that, that, that men obviously are, are, are more inclined to take risks than women, and women are a bit more risk averse and more inclined to be confident uh, when they're presenting and stuff like that. I mean, uh, all of you, I think, have got co-founders who, who, who are men. Um, Rachel, if you're, if you're going and you're presenting or trying to get funding or whatever, um, do, you know, do you feel that, 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 that women sometimes aren't pushing themselves forward as much as they should? And that is part of the problem that they're not getting the funding that they should and which could be a barrier? Um, I, I think there's two parts to that. I think when, when I look at myself and, and how much I've grown over the last five years, I've definitely lent in um, 
to the community that exists around me. And I know that sounds a little bit wishy-washy, but o- over the last five years, I- I've found so many female founders who have reached out or shared their stories or asked or spoken about their challenges. And I think it's about fostering and, and opening that community so that we can all feel comfortable and there is a safe environment for us all to just, you know, okay, I'm dealing with this problem right now. How can I resolve it? And feel comfortable in doing that with the people that are, ar- are around you. And I think, you know, looking back over the last five years, I've definitely you know, gone from that person who was standing there and saying, oh, please, Neil, can can you kind of present in, in this one? I'm not kind of feeling quite confident enough to be in the person that's like, I literally, I, I want to go in there and I just want to nail this. So <laughs> see ya kind of thing. And I think um, that's definitely come from seeing and experiencing kind of more female led brands that are around me that exist and have grown and have thrived in this environment and just seeing kind of their playbook and what are they doing really well. And just everybody in the media shining a light on on female founders and allowing people to have that voice. I think that's been so, so important in, especially in my growth um, over the last five years. Maxine, do do you agree with that? Yeah. Um, Yeah, because we really are in the the tech business. I mean, we're in food, but uh, half of the half of our employees will always be in tech. Um, And on the food side of things, um, the sales side of things, I think, you know, it's probably fairly easy to find women because I mean, I came from the food industry and there were a lot of women in the food industry before it was almost 50 50. But once you go into the tech side of things, um, everything changes. Uh, it's a lot harder to find women in tech, which is completely ridiculous because girls are, uh, are better at maths at school from a very um, early age. There's a load of statistics that show that, that that girls kind of, when they get to the engineer level, they don't believe in themselves anymore. And I think um, there's no fundamental reason for that. There's no logical reason for that. I think um, role models have been mentioned. I think that's probably very important. Um, and talking about uh, things like uh, fundraising, et cetera. Um, in fact, what, what I've seen over the last four or five years, it's just, you need to learn the methods. Um, and it's basically, how does it work? It's always the same thing when you want to raise funds. It, I mean, I, I, I've never done that before. Um, I definitely uh, lean on uh, the co-founder as well, who's more um, probably more uh, naturally, um, uh, I'd say confident in going out and asking for the money, et cetera. Even if the figures aren't there, you just kind of, you know, you go for it. Um, But what I've learned is it's just a question of, you know, uh, selling what the audience wants and uh, preparing and I think maybe women are better, better at that, doing the homework, preparing it all, and then just get up there and you do it and, it's in, and it works. And in, in the tech side of things, we really push to try and have women in the tech. Um, we're really pleased to have a, a, a female product owner. We've got front end, we've got back end, we've got data uh, people in there that uh, are women doing that. So we, we really do push. It's not easy to to actually find women because there are less on the market. But I think it's a question of role models as well. Um, There's no logical reason why women can't be in tech. And we just need to show that it is possible for the younger younger girls when they're at school, they carry on maths, they do engineering, and then they go out and they they become uh, computer scientists. So, so um, I, I'm going to start with you, uh, Lynette. Anybody listening who, who you know, is about to pitch or is to go for a round of funding or, or is standing up with a new, you know, in front of a new buyer and it's really, really important. Have you got any, any tips about how you stand up and, and give that presentation? I mean, my tip is that when I'm on the way, I always listen to Prodigy, like really loud, so I have to pump myself up a bit and, and make sure I'm standing tall and, 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 you know, make sure I have everything at my fingertips and then try and relax when I get there. Um, you know, how, how, how do you do it, Lynette? I mean, obviously you have to be prepared. Don't do a pitch impromptu. I always uh, advise people because I've had had people, I do a lot of stage work and I've had a lot of people come up to me afterwards asking how I do that or how I prepare. One, always know your opening and your closing, right? You don't memorize your presentation, but do memorize your first 30 seconds and the last thing you're gonna say. So that way you start strong, then you can go into your story flow and you can end strong. Second thing is somebody asked me about nerves, being nervous. 
And my response to that is if you're not nervous or kind of dead before you go onto a presentation, right? I mean, that's like the body's natural reaction to get you revved up to do this. So you just have to look at it, not from being nervous, but being excited and energized about what you're about to present. And that switches your mindset. And a couple of people I spoke to about that says it really works. You know, it's not going to be instantaneous. You have to practice. So keep going on stage, keep doing it. But those types of things work. And, you know, when I prepare for pitches, even though I've been doing them for eight years and I'm the co-founder and I know the story, I wrote the story, I still practice a lot. You know, because A, I try to keep my pitches varied. I don't like to do the same thing day in and day out. If somebody hears me twice, they're not really going to get the same story all the time. They'll sit this hear something new at all times. So it keeps me fresh. It keeps my presentation fresh. Uh, but I do prep for it quite a lot. And I will say, just to back up on one of the comments before with the male, female co-founders, it's probably, at least in our case, it was coincidence that, my, that we have a male co-founder and a female co-founder. But I will say, you know, I consider myself pretty strong as a presenter. I'm the storyteller. That's why I'm the CMO, Chief Marketing Officer. So I can tell you, uh, I'm a stronger storyteller than my co-founder, and he won't disagree with that. Uh, but sometimes, you know, when we are presenting, you need to see who you're presenting to and what that vibe is like. So there are times where I will present because uh, it's just my forte, but there are times where I will defer to my co-founder just because it's going to go over better, regardless of how that story is told. Now, whether that's a cultural thing, so we deal with a lot of different cultures, so there's different undertones there, or if it's a certain VC that tends to prefer uh, a male co-founder or that speaker, you kind of have to, I'm going to say play the game a little bit, you know, so you kind of do have to read who you're pitching to. So it's not just be a strong female, pitch all the time. Sometimes you really... It is what it is. I mean, that's the reason why we're having a female uh, event right now, right? So, because it's not the norm. So it's still a minority, even though the numbers are quite high in food tech. But sometimes, you know, it's the world we live in today. And sometimes you just have to play that male card or the female card, depending on who you're talking to at the moment. Okay, um, that's fairly a controversial thing to say, I, I would say. I mean, I think for me, the, the, the big thing is, is um, as you said, start, you know, um, memorize your start, memorize your finish. You know what you've got to say. You've got all your props with you. And then I do think you have to really absorb what the, the, the audience is telling you or who, who your presenter is telling you. Pick up any of those social clues. There's some things are really interested. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And, and you know, try and, and go with the flow once you're there, um, I think. Um, um, Rachel, for you, you, you suddenly, you're pushing Neil out the way a bit now. Um, Joking, but but you, you're obviously gaining confidence. How have you managed to do that as, as part of, of, of presenting? You know what, it takes um, a lot of practice, like Lynette was saying. I think you have to go um, make sure you're well prepared, go through everything that you need to, but you also have to be extremely adaptable to the, much like you're saying, the audience that you're about to pitch to. If something is looking a bit off or they're looking a little bit disinterested, you do have to kind of um, switch your tone and use your emotional intelligence a little bit. And I think that's where I've kind of thrived a little bit more than Neil, it's in my nature to kind of really read the room and really understand, um, okay, well, how is that person perceiving me right now? Or do I need to switch this up? Do I need to show a little bit more passion? Or do they not want to hear this part about my the, the detail of the product? Maybe they want to know a little bit more about the, the financials. Let's switch to that. And I think it it is a lot about the emotional intelligence of understanding what's going on around you right now. And that is hard to pinpoint to a, you know, a playbook for someone else to copy. Um, but in the sense of just just really looking around you. And, and I think that's been the, the biggest thing for us when, when we're leading the business also and the way that our managers lead also and then the culture of the company, I think, has been primarily through em emotional intelligence. And I think our business, especially in the hospitality industry, is all about people, how to get the best out of our people and how to, to ensure that everybody around us really um, feels the same vibe and culture that we're trying to, to get across. So I think, you know, there are traditional schools of management and I've certainly been there and encountered them and, and I've definitely worked under both male and female counterparts, but I think showing your team um, how your business can thrive, grow, succeed, really inspires them and um, takes their steps into the industry also. So I think that can have a positive impact in showcasing to people, oh, well, actually that's how 
Rachel did it in work. I'll, I'll, I think I'll kind of do that when I'm pitching next week. So I think that's how we've definitely tried to inspire our team as well. So I want to interview you all for five minutes and I'll make sure I've got the time to do that. So, so but just before I do that, um, Emily, just very, very quickly, any quick, uh, quick tip about, about presenting that, that, that you've sort of learned as, as, as you've gone along? Um, I, I think it's kind of, uh, uh, I think Lynette and Rachel have covered kind of most of the tips. I would say kind of in terms of pitching, actually, it's a, it's a series of meetings usually. And it's kind of also uh, how you engage with investors in advance. of. Uh, so it's not uh, kind of that uh, it's one pitch and that's it. Uh, it's also kind of how you bring your team uh, into the room. In It's how you engage up front. It's kind of... Uh, the things that you send to investors in advance. So it's creating kind of, uh, enough interest in advance of a meeting, which is also quite important. That's a really, really good point. And, and so what you're saying is you, you can't sort of stand up and say how efficient and responsive you are. And actually, <clears throat> they've sent you an email, you haven't replied for two weeks. Um, you've got to get all of that right all the way from the way you reply to the way you you deal with people afterwards and it's a really 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 good point maxine have you quickly got anything to add in terms of presenting um, I, th I think uh, i think the uh, one point is also when you're presenting is if if you're not just one person presenting this quite often you're you're there's three or four or five uh, whether whether it's a, a sales pitch or a, a finance pitch what is really important, if, if, if there's two of you as well, I think uh, maybe also a man and a woman, you can, you can gauge different things because um, body language is not the same, the, the reactions are not the same, the sensibility is not the same. And also just being two people, one is, one is pitching and the other one is reading the room. It's very difficult to do both at the same time. Uh, sometimes you skip things, sometimes people ask you a question and you're not quite sure about it, but the other one's heard the question better than you have so can kind of cut in and answer that so um i think going in uh two people you have to be really well uh organized in who is the lead in in the pitch and who is actually backing up and you have to be very good not to kind of interrupt etc but you can have a you can have a really good pitch um if if you know each other and if you you know how the other one interacts so you so can work better work interact with the audience yeah, yeah work as a team yeah um, okay so i'm going to go i'm going to go to each of you uh for five minutes and then we're going to take um 10 minutes of questions at the end um i'm going to start um with you rachel um you know the pandemic has forced you to change your business model um to to, to survive uh, really well not not to survive i suppose but but grow on the trajectory that you that you wanted to so you're now selling meal kits and retail products online that's not what you started off trying to do um and obviously the, uh, can you expand a bit on the challenges of suddenly having to to to, to pivot um so much um and and you know how did you manage to do that yeah absolutely um this was a kind of a critical business decision for us i think in the uk obviously we had the news around a year ago that we had to basically close our restaurants so for us at the time that was basically closing down your business overnight for the foreseeable future. And uh, that's a bit of a panic moment for everybody, um, no doubt. So without any real understanding of kind of the rates of infection at that point or, or even what this was. Um, so I think the crucial thing for us was to ensure our teams at the time, we employed at 55 people across like different stores. Um, they were safe, make sure they were protected. In London, of course, everyone travels via underground to get to where they need to go. So I think um, at that point, I, I don't think the government had many kind of measures in place to protect people in those very early days. So the first initial thing for us was, okay, well we have to close our restaurants and we have to keep our team safe and we have to make sure they're they're paid and, and everything is okay so that was the pivotal moment for us because obviously we had no idea of the future of the industry at that point um what was happening with the pandemic so whilst all of our teams were home our customers were still reaching out to us on social media okay guys i understand why you're closed but please can i still get a burger so i think it was that that um, consumer passion for our brand and, and them reaching out to us that made us think oh well hey what if we were to still pack up all the elements of this burger into a box and just deliver it to people's homes let's just you know make our website kind of transactional overnight and let's just go all in and it was that that we sorry to interrupt but so, so what you're saying uh, in essence is 
even though it wasn't quite our, our business model, even though we might not be making as much as a profit, actually keeping communication with your customers through this so that you don't lose them and they don't forget about you is really important. Exactly. So we knew how important it was to keep the business rolling from a customer's perspective because we had no idea about the future of how long this was going to last, what was the foreseeable future of the hospitality industry. So we, um, at that point in time, you know, we had these meal kits, we sold them online, we were physically driving them around London ourselves, we, we really went back to basics. But at the same time, it was technology that really helped us with those decisions. And, you know, through social media, our website, and everything that we were creating with our retail products that were coming up also, was really critical to us. And, and yes, it was a huge pivotal moment for our business, but it ended up saving us in the long run, to the point that we still um, make our meal kits online now, even though our restaurants are open. So yeah so we're beginning to get some um, great questions um from people who are um listening in so i will come to those at the end please keep them keep them going um rachel you know um we've got news in the uk i'm sure it's going to happen in other countries um fairly soon too that that, that you know lockdown is going to end how so what are you going to do when when you change your business model and are you going to go back are you going to do a hybrid what what where do you think you will go now Definitely. I think our retail products that we now sell online will be there for the foreseeable future. Um, we sell them in supermarkets now. We've obviously um, grown in that, in that aspect also. But our initial reason why we had them online was to just create that channel between us as a brand and our consumers who still wanted access to what we were doing. So I think that will still be there and it's still prevalent to us. Direct to consumer is huge and it's growing and, and it always will be a big part of our business. But essentially when um, it comes to summer and you know the government has a good plan of action with regards to when people can get back outside again and it'll be safe you know, to, to a degree, our restaurants are still a, a huge part of our business and it's still where a lot of our innovation happens also with regards to new products, new things on the menu, um, in the ways that we interact with our consumer also at, at, at a retail store level. So I think, you know, it, it will be a hybrid and it definitely, you know, we, we have to be fluid in the sense that we're, we're adapting to what the consumer wants and it is a constant battle of trying to figure out, okay, what do people want today? And we, we're just adapting as we go along, to be honest. And I think that's going to be something uh, much more in people's armory now as entrepreneurs. It's it's yeah. the pandemic for us is you know it's everything's got to be even more flexible than it was before. And you've got to have the decision making processes in place where you can react. Yeah. And and whilst we've all been saying that, that that having a clear vision is really important, of course it is to do with your brand and your culture. Yeah. But you've got to have the ability, haven't you, to to to, to look at the outside world and go, do you know we have, we're going to have to change this. <laughs> we have to do this. But I'm going to do it quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So final question from me, um, alternative protein, um, especially plant-based alternatives are gaining a huge momentum and becoming mainstream. Uh, figures in fact show that veganism hasn't actually changed that much, you know, dedicated vegans, but uh, people are intermittently vegan um, for health reasons and ethical reasons. Um, how are you going to persuade more and more of us to, to actually look at, at plant-based alternatives, which we should do? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I think you're right. They proteins, vegan proteins are gaining huge, huge momentum right now. And I think it's becoming quite normal in many markets globally as well. And I think that's personally where I believe our restaurant environment as it starts to reopen will really come to the forefront. So for, for years, since the very beginning of our journey, I think, um, you know, we've been showcasing to our customers just how amazing vegan fast food can be. And, you know, we've done that through our accessibility, how delicious our food is, the high quality nature of what we do, and making sure that, you know, they're amazing flavors and, and they're innovative and convenient. So combining all that together and at, at a, an affordable price has been critical um, for us and the formula for change for many people. We noticed really quickly, actually, um, during the pandemic close down, how much our community really relied on us to access vegan fast food. Um, the messages and the outpour from our community when we were closed of how much people missed us and just kept on coming in and in and in. So I think the reasons why, if we look at it, why people like McDonald's have seen a huge mass adoption for fast food um, is likely because of, you know, it's cheap, it's affordable, it's accessible. 
Um, people want that, people want fast and affordable, but they want it with a brand that shares the same values and ethical standpoint now more than ever before. And I think that's where, in my opinion, um, we will see vegan fast food industry rise to the forefront in the coming years. They'll become more normalized. Um, you know, people just walking into a fast food restaurant that just happens to be vegan just because they, you know, the food is that good. Yeah. And I think that's where we'll see the dial shifting and the money being spent in this industry. And that's where people will have the budget to innovate and then create new products and the mass adoption of those products. And it will just roll and spiral yeah. from there. A, a virtuous circle. Um, yeah. Thank you, Rachel. We've got some good questions coming up, which I'll come back to you awesome. later on. Uh, Maxine, connecting food. Now, you provide a blockchain based platform. What is blockchain? <laughs> well, in I think sector, anyway, yeah. how, you know, how are you making that work for you? Um, well, what we actually, the objective of what we're actually doing is to be able to trace food right back to the source and right all the way down to uh, the, the actual product you're buying and you're eating. Um, and in fact, what is interesting is that traceability information has been, it's existed for the last uh, 10, 15 years. It's a, it's, le it's a legal obligation for each food actor to provide that. But um, what uh, the blockchain actually brings into that is blockchain comes from finance. It's actually been used for transactions. And when you look at the supply chain, it, it's a whole load of transactions between different actors going from um, you know, animal feed to farms, going through um, first and second transformation processes, then branding and then the retailer. So in fact, that's where we saw in 2016, the opportunity to use blockchain in the food industry to bring total transparency by um, getting that traceability information, which is stored in each kind of silo uh, throughout the chain and putting it all together. So batch to batch, you know, batch level um, traceability right to the end, which brings in a whole load of efficiencies, obviously, but also uh, this transparency. The, well, one thing which is really important is that blockchain um, is good uh, at measuring numbers like Bitcoin or, or dollars or whatever. Um, but what blockchain can't do is to tell you that that egg, for example, that you're actually going to consume really is organic. It can tell you how many eggs, etc. But it's not as good um, at telling you, uh, you know, that what is the quality of that food that you're buying. That's why right at the beginning, we saw the opportunity for blockchain, but also with a smart module, which we, which we actually developed uh, a really um, uh, a breakthrough innovation, which we call Live Audit. Live Audit is a tool which will actually uh, measure and qualify that food um, as it's moving through the supply chain. And the blockchain will actually make sure that it is immutable. You can't change information once that is on the blockchain. So the two linked together means that you can do real-time traceability, um, and you can also make sure that the food that started off in the farm, the egg, it act is actually organic right through to the end. So um, what is important is that we actually take information that exists, traceability information, we take audit information which also exists, and we will actually read that every single day going through our live audit smart module. We would register on the blockchain, which means that nobody can change that once it's on there. Um, and that's, that's when that's, that's at the end- That's blockchain, isn't it? I mean, it is completely and utterly secure in that, 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 that respect. And, and, and there have been some dreadful scandals in terms of you know people not understanding where their foods come from. But the biggest shock for the public, I think, is that they absolutely believe that supermarkets were the guardians of this and then have realised that they're not because they have no clue. And exactly. surely blockchain has to be the answer to, 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 to actually that, that yes. transparency. Yeah. And, and surely the retailers are just as keen to have that as the consumers must be. Yes. Well, in fact, all the way along, because we've we actually seen a, a huge amount of upstream producers uh, that are really keen to go onto this kind of um, uh, solution, this platform, because it also opens up a window of transparency for them right through to the end of the chain. Um, and the consumer is also looking through that window of transparency and saying, where does my food come from? And so retailers and brands, they're actually having to jump on the black brand wagon because otherwise, you know, their role within that is going to be reduced. So, um, and it's actually a win-win situation because um, 
all this information like traceability data and all that it's a cost for every company to have to produce that store that and do nothing with it unless you have a product recall but what you can actually do is you leverage that information and you make it in you create value with it because um, it's a new way of actually showing to the consumer what they're eating and as consumers we all want to know that we all, all want to know who produced it also um, is there fair pay towards the person who's produced that? Yeah. Um, also, what happens in terms of, you know, what, what transformation has actually happened to that food? And all of that information can be totally transparent in a very um, verified way uh, by using different smart modules along the way. Okay. Talk about that for ages. Um, Emily, can I come on to you? Oddbox. Now, food waste is definitely one of the most pressing challenges of our time. It, I, I find it such a dreadful thing at the moment that, that on the one hand, we've got real issues um, around obesity, which the pandemic has highlighted, uh, I think. Uh, so uh, we've got that on one hand. And on the other hand, we've got food poverty and we've got food banks and whatever. And, and yet we've got all this food going to waste. Um, um, and, you know, how can we expand your type of business and your model to, 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 to go further, I suppose, and, and, and try and address this issue of of food waste when so many people have got food poverty yeah so so you're so you're right so kind of uh, actually very few people uh, know uh, kind of, uh, enough about the issue of food waste and the fact that uh, we waste a third of the food we produce and actually uh, very few people know that with just a quarter of the food we waste, we could feed, we could solve the issue of food poverty. So it's kind of so obviously on the globe that's on a global level, and it's not as simple because there's more food poverty in uh, in specific places than in other. But even in the UK, there's a huge amount of food poverty, and a lot of uh, and that's why there's been kind of uh, recent scandals around the uh, school school meals. And, but uh, uh, it's actually Food Waste uh, Action Week this week. So a full week organized by RAP. And uh, so amongst uh, other food waste fighting organizations where and retailers and uh, supply organizations, we're all participating in re raising that awareness of uh, the link between food waste and climate change. And for us, what we're doing is as much around working directly, directly with fresh produce suppliers and um, Offering an outlet for produce which are either which either don't meet supermarket specification or are surplus to requirements, uh, because there's still kind of, uh, a lot of difficulties in forecasting the weather and being able to plan what the consumers will want. Uh, but our focus is also about uh, educating, informing, and raising awareness and helping people do something about it. And a lot of food waste happen in people's home as well. So for us, it's also how do we help people uh, cook with different types of produce and utilize, the, make the most of what they purchase. It's quite a complex issue, isn't it? Um, food yeah. I think the thing that, 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 that is so worrying for me is that so much goes to waste before we even get to the supermarket, before we even get to our houses and, 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 and throw things out. Very, very quick one. Um, we're getting a great question, so I do want to come on to those. Um, in March 2020, you raised a three and a half million dollars Series A, and, and and during the pandemic, you achieved 600% growth year on year. In my opinion, scaling up quickly is the most dangerous point um, of, of, of business life. Um, it, it's the time when you're most likely to fail when you're growing quickly because, because simply you run out of cash to, to fund the growth. Um, how have you managed to carefully grow and yet quickly grow? Um, to make sure that you you know you weren't in danger of overheating. Yeah, yeah and actually, kind of for us, we're a subscription business. So the all kind of uh, success of a subscription business is to retain the customers, and uh, um, and that's how we uh, we can make money. So it's not in just having one purchase. And so uh, actually, in early March, we had to take our website down because uh, we had our existing. <laughs> customer base uh, switching to more boxes, uh, switching to more regular boxes, and we doubled our orders uh, just kind of in, in the matter of a few days. So we really took uh, a few weeks pause to kind of work with our co-packer, work with our delivery partner to see how we could scale in a way which didn't compromise the customer experience. So it's been very, been very much about how do we make sure that uh, we're able to scale in a way that uh, we're able to maintain our service excellence. And, and that's, that's been a challenge uh, 
uh, uh, during, uh, during the pandemic. Yeah. And again, that's about having this strong brand, making sure your staff know and your suppliers know what you expect, what you don't expect, and absolutely keeping um, um, uh, in control of quality. quality. Okay, again, another topic we could talk about for ages. Um, Lynette, finally, with you, before we go, we've got amazing questions that that, that I want to ask you all. Um, You've developed a really interesting product, um, um, uh, 3D printing um, in food. Um, Can you explain exactly what the business model is? Because... Um, because for me, it's 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 not about doing some type of novelty thing in a restaurant, is it? You've got much bigger ambitions than that in 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 in, in your company. That is correct. So to take a step back, the whole idea of three D food printing is actually not as crazy as it sounds. <laughs> you eat anything from a food manufacturer, you're practically already eating three D printed food. We just don't call it that, right? So food manufacturer takes food, they push it through machines, they shape it, and they form it. We took that exact same concept, created a kitchen appliance. But the big difference is you become the manufacturer, you use your own ingredients. So what we're not is we're not like Nespresso that forces you to buy a pre-filled coffee castle to use their machine. We actually encourage you to use those fresh ingredients so you can get your box ingredients and you can 3D print food. And it's, it, as you say, there is a novelty aspect to it, right? I've done talks before where is it a novelty or is it needed? And my response to that is, why is it an or? It's an and question, right? So yes, you can do the novelty things. You can do cake decorations, cookie decorations. You can do these um, very intricate presentations of food. So we have quite a number of Michelin star chefs that are all about this intricate plating that only 3D food printing can do. But the needed part of it, the reason why we started into this business in the first place is because we do see in the future that this will become a common kitchen appliance for the purpose of you making your own foods that you now currently buy in a supermarket. So that doesn't mean it's the odd looking food or the really intricate food only. That means think about your rectangular breakfast bars, your round cereal O's, your square ravioli. I mean, all these things you can actually replicate customize it using your own fresh ingredients. And it's really going along that trend that we've been talking about today, about knowing where your ingredients are, what's in your food, where did it come from? So if you can use those raw forms of food, the the raw ingredients and prepare it yourself, you're gonna have a lot more trust and customization doing that. Now the business model, getting back to your question, is today it's a B2B market, right? So it's not ready for consumer use yet not too different from microwaves, food processors, sous vide devices, all started in the B2B space and then went over to consumers. Um, But it's a lot of different spaces in B2B, whether it's your Michelin starred chefs or your hospitality markets or research and development, we're working with a lot of these all protein companies or even hospitals and senior living centers. We can actually print foods with texture, but in this case, we need to print purees for people who have trouble swallowing, who have dysphagia. And that's actually quite a big market. So what we do is we shape the food to look normal. So you can take pureed turkey and print it in the shape of a turkey leg or pureed carrots and print it in the shape of carrot rounds. So it's all about that psychological aspect that goes along with food. Because food, of course, it's not just fuel. We gauge it by how it looks, how it tastes, how it smells. So that visual aspect is actually very important. And that's what 3D food printing can contribute to as well. Um, I really get that 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 last point that you're saying, and uh, actually really important because because food and, and maybe one of the reasons we all got into the food sector is is food is to do with being with friends. It's to do with socialising. You know, it's not just about the food that we eat and, and all those sort of things we say. I'm really sorry. We have to go to the questions now. Can I remind anybody uh, that's joining us? There's some great um, contacts to be made. Um, you can go through on the chat thing. There's there's people offering. Uh, incubators funding and all sorts of other things so if we don't get we've got quite a lot of questions if we don't get to your question today please do um, c- contact and connect with other people um, because there's loads of people out there who, who, who are happy to help um, one of the questions that I would like um, to ask um, is uh, um, is from Iris um, and what she's saying is uh, what is the tipping point uh, for you to go um, full-time on your startup you know what it's like you're spending lots and lots of time you're doing it part-time I know Emily you were doing it in Saturday in your bedroom you know all that sort of stuff at what point do you you say right I'm gonna have to do this I'm gonna chuck it on I'm gonna be brave um Emily could you could you answer that question what was the bit for you where you go no we're gonna we're gonna do this yeah so so actually I started uh, 
hot box with my uh, husband and he was kind of uh, so he had left his job and so he was kind of uh, full time so uh, at the start it was very much kind of uh, I was still working uh, in a full time job and uh, uh, he uh, he became more and more full time into Outbox. The time when I decided to uh, join was actually when um, uh, six months before we thought uh, we could uh, raise investment. So it was very much kind of uh, we bootstrapped uh, for the first one one and a half year, and then there was a point where we kind of uh, were at the tipping point of having enough customers, having enough traction to show that uh, actually there there was a big market. We had we had we were at that stage of having proven that uh, we could grow, and I think that kind of uh, it it very much depends because for us uh, we were selling from the start, uh, so in some ways we were revenue generating and making a small profit uh, or kind of reinvesting uh, some some of that into um, bringing a few people on the team. So I think it depends also on the type of businesses uh, if it's kind of a very uh, heavy tech or the not revenue generating, then it requires investment earlier. Plus, uh, we bootstrap for quite a long time. Mm. I mean, this this follows on from from another question um, um, from Monica. Now, she's saying she's a young female who wants to start up um, in the vegan food industry. Um, um, so, Rachel, I'm going to ask you this question. Um, she says she says so many people advising her just start, you know, just do it, just jump, just go for it, just go for it. But she said, is there one piece of advice where suddenly, a bit like Emily's saying, you just go right, I'm, sorry, I'm going to do this. And, and what is that piece of advice um, in, in order to, to 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 lessen the risk to some degree? Um, well, I, th I think that there are a few factors because you have to make sure that um, you have enough funding to be able to also make sure that you're okay at home and you're not pushing yourself to the limits of, of existence here. So, you know, you, you have to be comfortable with all of your choices, um, much like many other stories. I, I literally worked for nine months solidly in my full time job whilst also, you know, making this happen. So I would, you know, work Monday to Friday, then make burgers on a Saturday, sell them on Sunday in a market. And I did that on repeat for nine months. That's tough. But at the same time, it allowed us to gain market traction. It allowed us to build a community. It allowed us to see, OK, well, and gain feedback for from for your product. And all of those three things led us to this exact point where we were like, OK, we either go all in at this or we leave this idea. But we realized that there is too much and that the opportunity was so great for us to make this business awesome that we just had to go for it. And and there is a little bit of, you know, you have to trust your gut in that judgment, of course. And you have to listen to the people around you and your the, the community you've built. Are they saying great things? Are they are they encouraging you? And I think once you've built that picture in your mind, you'll realize or not whether it's the next step or it's the right step for you to take. Monica, do it. That's what we're saying. Do it. 100%. Do it. Monica, do it. Okay, this is a question from Carol. It's a, it's a, it, you might consider this a boring question, but do you know what? It's really, really important this when, when you start your business. Are there any tips for putting in place the systems you need to support growth? You know, like your CRM systems, HR systems, and all that sort of stuff. Um, um, so, um, Emily, do you, um, sorry, not Emily, um, uh, uh, Lynette, do you have any advice, uh, for example, putting those rather boring but incredibly important things in place? Yeah, of course, it's always easier to do it early. Uh, you know, you don't want to just have contacts in your email contact list and try to, you know, keep track of everybody via emails. It's not really going to work. You don't need to go for the super high end systems from day one. There is a lot of other systems out there that are free or cheap that are CRM systems that as you grow, if you need to get something that's better or more diverse or more robust, rather, you can always upgrade them later on, even if it's to a different vendor. But at least start with something that is a proper CRM. Um, the, actually, the systems we use are integrated totally. So it's billing, it's CRM, it's marketing, it's everything. Uh, but, you know, stay focused. You can't do everything at once, right? So there's a ton of systems out there. We'll have a bunch of integration packages to them. Really choose what you need to do. Usually CRM is the first that most startup companies start with. Is so you can keep track of who's who when you've contacted them and all your providers. So that's usually the core one. And then the rest of them you can tap on as you need them. But you don't need to, you know, blow a huge budget right. on these types of systems because that's not your core business. That's supporting your business. So you want to make sure you keep that expense realistic. First thing you must do though, guys, always, always, always make sure you've got shareholder agreements, make sure you've got contracts in place. 
um, make sure you've got all that side of it sorted out. And they're, 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 you know, they're, they're quite standardized, but you absolutely have to have those. Right, last question, Maxine. Uh, we've got a question here from Tara. Um, what she's saying is that, that she hasn't got tech experience you know, and she hasn't particularly got food experience, but, but she does have uh, management and sales skills. Is, is it still appropriate to be going into the food sector? Um, I think I think everything depends on what you want to do. Um, I think you can obviously going into the food sector, you don't need to have tech experience. I think if you're good at sales um, and you know how to sell a product, you can learn how to sell a product and go go into it. Um, I personally believe that when you go into a fairly complex industry such as food, it is an advantage to know how uh, the complex supply chains work and have contacts in that industry. It obviously helps you accelerate, but um, but I think uh, as we were saying before, somebody said uh, that um, if you don't come from the industry, you may be able to disrupt that industry even more easily. Um, it, it, everything depends on the angle of attack that you actually want to, to take. I personally came from the food industry, but I didn't know anything about tech. So I, I, I now know a lot of things about tech. I think the, you can do the other way around. Uh, if you're really good at sales, uh, you can obviously go into uh, food, even if you don't come from food. Uh, you just need to, have to learn what is the product that you're selling and who you're selling it to. If you're good at sales, it will, I think that will work fine anyway. Yes, well, um, we're running out of time. Um, I, I want to say thank you so much to our four panellists. Um, it's, it's really good of you um, to give up your time and, and to share some of your knowledge and experience. So thank you, Rachel Hugh, co-founder of The Burger Company. Keep growing, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, come along and have one of those burgers at some point. Um, uh, Maxine Roper, uh, co-founder and MD of Connecting Food. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, Emily uh, Van Popperai, uh, co-founder and CEO of Oddbox. Again, thank you for your time. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, Lynette Kuzma, um, coming to us from Barcelona, Natural Machines, co-founder and CMO. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, there's still questions. Please do connect. Um, I'm going to hand over to you now, Alessio. I've finished. There you go. <laughs> thank you so much, Sue. Thank you very much for the panelists. I can't thank you uh, enough. I know that you're very busy and uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Um, <clears throat> just going to spend the last couple of minutes to wrap up uh, the session. Thanks also to everyone who have uh, joined us today. Uh, we were pretty actually uh, impressed about the turnout. <laughs> Uh, we had about 95% uh, women uh, attendees, which is a great also result for us, as I guess uh, it means that there is more uh, women out there to get inspired by you and by your word of wisdom and hopefully uh, will enter the space soon enough. Um, and uh, without further ado, just let me do some uh, uh, housekeeping uh, sort of uh, wrapping up notes. <laughs> One is, uh, again, to thank you um, for the time uh, to all the panelists. Um, and secondly, just to remind you of the next uh, webinars we have uh, coming up on March the 17th, we will be talking uh, with uh, top-notch speakers uh, running alternative protein companies, and uh, we will host uh, some of the uh, top 10 uh, uh, that made it into our list. And on the 31st of March, uh, at the same time, we will be doing uh, the one about vertical farming. So without further ado, uh, I see also that we keep getting uh, lots of questions and, and really nice comments. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sue. I can't thank you enough for the brilliant job that they always do in moderating uh, uh, these sessions. And uh, for everyone who has any other questions, uh, feel free to drop us a line at info at this is also a place. A, a quick thing to say, Alessio, very quick question. Somebody said, what is CRM? CM is a, a, a customer relationship management system, which is which will track how you how you connect with your customers all the way through. So just answering that question very quickly. Yes. <laughs> Thanks also for this too. You're amazing. Thanks everyone. And uh, as I said, this is also a place for us to connect. So we're very well, we're very happy that, you know, we've seen a lot of engagements uh, coming through the chat uh, and we very much encourage this as after all, our mission is really to connect uh, uh, these ecosystem players and foster the space as much as possible. So thanks a lot for tuning in and uh, we wish you a great day, evening, uh, afternoon, whatever you're tuning in from.
Cheers.